Good morning, everyone. My name is Joan Batorf. I'm a professor at the School of Nursing and director of the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention here at the University of British Columbia's Okanagan campus in Kelowna, British Columbia. And I want to begin this morning by acknowledging that the land on which we gather here today is a traditional unceded territory of the Silk Okanagan Nation and their people. I also want to acknowledge that you are joining us from both near and far, and I want to recognize the traditional owners, past and present, of those lands as well. It's, I'm delighted to welcome so many of you here today. I'm glad you were able to join us for this uh, special webinar that we're co-hosting today with the North Okanagan Hospice Society. We have uh, a speaker, Dr. Sarah Hales, who will be introduced to you shortly. And I do want to let you know that there will be time for questions or comments at the end of our, uh, of our presentation. And I'd encourage you to put them in the chat box as you think of them, as you go, as we go along or at the end uh, of the presentation, whenever you feel you would like to. And we'll read those out to um, Dr. Hales at the end. And uh, she'll have an opportunity to answer your questions and provide a few additional comments. So with that uh, instruction, I want to introduce uh, Clara Dick from the North Okanagan Hospice Society. Clara. Hi Joan, thanks so much and good morning to all you. North Okanagan Hospice Society is so pleased to have this ongoing relationship with the Institute for Healthy Living and Chronic Disease Prevention. As Joan said, my name is Clara Dick. I'm the Education and Resource Leader here at North Okanagan Hospice Society. I'm a registered nurse and part of my mandate is to move hospice palliative care philosophy and subjects out from underneath our hospice roof into the community and into our country. So it is our pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah Hale, psychiatrist, Division of Psychosocial Oncology at the Princess Margaret Cancer Centre in Toronto. Dr. Hales will be sharing with us today the caregiver experience of medical assistance in dying. Dr. Hales, over to you. Thanks so much, Clara. Can you hear me? Terrific. So I am um, really so honored to be invited. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Clara, for asking me. Uh, I love to present the work that we're doing and the talk about these issues, particularly the caregiver experience. I, I think the, one of the, the sad things is that I can't see all of you. And whenever I present, that's one of the best parts of it is seeing people's faces and getting a sense of what resonates with people, um, what they're interested in, what they seem confused by. So I, I really echo uh, Joan's request that you think of questions and comments and put them in the chat because uh, we'll have a chance hopefully to have some back and forth near the end uh, of this presentation. I am presenting here today from Toronto, but I am the face of a much bigger team. I need to acknowledge Renat Nassim, who is a clinical psychologist and researcher I work with. Uh, on, on a lot of our caregiver projects, including the projects we're doing, uh, looking at medical assistance in dying experience, as well as our research coordinator, Aaron Tong. And a lot of the data too, I'm gonna talk about today has been analyzed by one of the psychiatry residents who's been working with us, Tharshika Thangarasa. So I'll acknowledge them and, and uh, let's get going. So, I just wanted to say I have no disclosures. Uh, the other thing I did want to just comment upon as we go is that all of the images I'm going to use in this presentation, all the paintings and drawings are, are from Robert Pope. Um, many of you may be familiar with him. Um, uh, Robert Pope died of, of Hodgkin's uh, disease many years ago. The Robert Pope Foundation, I highly recommend taking a look at his archives. I can't think of an artist who has, I, I, I think evoked the advanced disease experience for patients and families as well. And all of his work is really beautiful. So I'm gonna use that throughout this presentation and I need to acknowledge him. 
I thought I'd begin to tell you how I started to do this work and where I, I've been coming from since I began uh, my career as a researcher. I started with an interest in the quality of the dying experience when I was a psychiatry resident, a bit of an unusual area for psychiatrists uh, at the time. I think we're becoming more a part of the world of palliative care over time, but uh, I think it still is unusual for psychiatrists to work in this area. And I was really interested in the quality of the dying experience as a whole. I was interested in knowing what it was like subjectively for patients and families near the very end of life. And I began working in cancer care at the Princess Margaret and, and a project that started small uh, mushroomed into my PhD. And I, one of the interesting things that came out of that research for me were, were a few things. Firstly, the complexity of end of life experience. So not surprisingly, just like quality of life, sort of the quality of dying and death is, is various and it depends on people's values, you know, their, their life situation, uh, but it's also relational very much. I think those people that work in palliative care and hospice are certainly aware of this, that we die in a relational context where dying is an exper a shared experience. People, the body dies of an individual, but it has an impact on certainly that circle of care and family and the healthcare providers that are involved. And so when, we, when we're talking about is what's a good death or a bad death, uh, all of those opinions often uh, play, have, have, some, have some play. And, and certainly when we're looking at research that's trying to examine this, most of the measures that, that are out there involve a uh, report from often bereaved caregivers, sometimes uh, healthcare providers after patients have died. And when we look at those reports, when we look at, at, the, at uh, how they are constructing the end of life experience, what's been interesting to me is that people are pulling in not only their own experience, what they saw with their own eyes, what they think and feel, but the experience of others. So if you're talking to family members, they're talking about the experience of the patient, they're talking about the experience of other family members. And it is really a, a very complicated and relational construct. It's difficult, I think, to tease apart what is uh, what are the different individual experiences. It matters a lot to us what everyone else is, is thinking and feeling about end of life. And certainly within families, issues around burden uh, and um, that shared experience, even it's, I would say dignity, these are relational constructs. And it's very, it's very important, I think, to understand them within, within a family uh, construct. So uh, I think that one thing that became clear to me after doing that research, that page, my PhD involved interviewing over 400 bereaved caregivers, uh, of advanced cancer patients is this idea that uh, informal caregivers, family members, spouses, friends, whoever the patient identifies as their as their family, these are the invisible backbone of healthcare. Uh, once you start to see caregivers and once you start to notice how much they are involved in healthcare, it's really incredible uh, the extent to which our healthcare system relies on them. And that reliance on informal caregiving is only growing. As, as you know, patients are having more and more of their treatment as outpatients, hospital stays are shorter and shorter. And of course, people are living longer and longer with advanced disease. I work in cancer care. And even in the time I have worked in the field, it's really incredible to me how much longer people are living with metastatic disease, sometimes disease that has a significant uh, burden in terms of disability and symptoms. And so family caregivers are, are involved for longer. Their lives are focused on caregiving for longer. Some uh, stats can uh, had reported 46% of Canadians in a given year are involved in, in the care significantly of a family member or friend. When we drill down and look at who are these people, well, they are most often fall between this 45 and 64 uh, age range. Uh, most often women, although this is changing a lot, it still is that women provide the majority of informal care. And when we're looking at diseases such as cancer, there are most often spouses that are called in to provide this kind of support. 
And in terms of what they are providing, it is uh, broad. Uh, they are providing emotional support to patients, instrumental support, so finding information, accessing resources, uh, finding out about different medical referrals. They're providing tangible support, transportation, household chores, and also all doing a lot of medical care, so providing uh, administration of medication at home. Uh, and so we're, there, there is a lot that they are doing. And at the same time, they are patients in their own right. We know the more we examine this, that they have very high levels of distress. And in most reports, we see it's, it's equal to or actually higher than that, sometimes reported by patients. 68% of family caregivers uh, report unmet psychosocial needs right at the time of diagnosis, but those needs continue over time, even when patients might have a curative illness. And younger caregivers tend to have more unmet needs than older caregivers, and there's some um, demographics that suggest that women have, have more un un greater unmet needs than, than, than male caregivers. And they have, so they have this own distress, but, but we also see that they're very self-silencing or they're not talking about their needs or they're protective of patients. And we know that that silencing, that sense, that stigma about accessing their own support is also associated with increased distress. And we know at the same time, if we can access them, support them, provide them with help and resources, that improving the mental well-being and health of caregivers actually can also help the well-being of patients. I should also say, I, I'm gonna talk a lot about distress and strain and burden, but I think also we know that there is a lot of meaning and growth that comes from the caregiving role. Uh, and so I think that we want to be thinking about it in that way. We really want to facilitate the best possible experience, I think, of being involved in care, particularly of a loved one at the very end of life that we can, because that can be very meaningful. And the memories of that experience then carry on with that individual and that family long after uh, their loved one has, has died. So again, I'm, I imagine I'm speaking to a group that understands this, that, that families really are the unit of care when we're talking about end of life and palliative care. Um, that because of the increased dependency of the patients and, and fluctuating capacity, pa family need to be pulled in more and more. But even though we may talk about family-centered care, and certainly in my hospital, we talk about that a lot, healthcare remains organized around the patient. And um, we really have a lot of uh, difficulty accessing caregivers and providing them support. Caregivers um, uh, are, uh, some of the obstacles include the fact that patients are gatekeepers of information sharing. So in my hospital, a patient decides who's there with them at an appointment, certainly, and what information can be shared uh, and with whom. Um, even in research, and I'll talk to you a little bit about the research we're doing, our patients are the gatekeepers of access to caregivers for research purposes as well. So if a patient doesn't want us to approach their family, uh, we are not able to in my facility. Uh, caregivers tend not to be screened routinely for distress. We know routine screening is very important in order to access and support patients. Uh, something is similar for caregivers, but we don't routinely screen them. Uh, privacy issues prevent information sharing on the part of healthcare providers. So healthcare providers are often reluctant to talk and, and bring families into the conversation. Even uh, space uh, and the nature of hospital charts marginalize family members. So in my hospital, we have hospital rooms sometimes with a chair, but or sometimes no chair and no room for patients. Uh, our waiting rooms are not set up for caregivers to, to be there uh, and, and perhaps working while their loved ones are in chemo uh, or, or ill. And again, I think medical legally, patient autonomy and medical decision making also excludes family caregivers, even though, and again, we might talk about this a bit, particularly when it comes to medical assistance in dying, even though we know that many healthcare decisions, including the decision around made, are relational decisions. These are decisions patients make in the context of a family. Often, even often, one of the reasons people are pursuing MAID is because of concerns about burden on loved ones. So these are relational decisions and they're taking into consideration uh, their loved ones and their experience. Uh, but medical legally, we look at the individual and their decision as though theirs alone and actually 
for the sake of, of made uh, assessment, want to be sure that they are they're not factoring in uh, or unduly influenced by uh, loved ones in, in that decision. So it's all of these things, I think, prevent us from seeing the bigger relational context and exclude uh, caregivers from much of our conversation clinically about, about care. I also just want to say something about grief and bereavement because I think there's this other uh, there's other process there's the coping with advanced disease process but there's also grief and bereavement that family caregivers are struggling with you know grief is a, is the normal process of reacting to a loss uh, and it, it begins before the loss. Uh, so pay, families are often experiencing anticipatory grief and beginning that grief process as soon as a loved one is diagnosed with a life-threatening illness. Bereavement, of course, is that period after the loss. Um, but, the, but the grief, as I, as I mentioned, that really begins uh, beforehand. And so simultaneously through coping with the advanced disease and, and uh, accompanying their loved one through that process, they're also anticipating loss of that person and disconnecting from them and sometimes preparing and sometimes involved in that actual process while their loved one is still alive. We know that this is an incredibly painful process. We know also it's very natural um, and that we see that it fluctuates and, and grief tends to decrease over time. Um, and you know, 10 to 20% uh, of the bereaved will experience complications and, and uh, actual psychiatric disorder, uh, depending on the the um, perspective we can, we may call that post-traumatic stress disorder in some cases. There's also the constructs of complicated grief or prolonged grief disorder to describe a more problematic course of those symptoms. Uh, for instance, complicated grief, that's response um, that lasts more than six months after, after death and is characterized by problematic preoccupation with the deceased and intense distress, uh, as well as a significant impairment of, of functioning. In terms of what are the risks for more problematic bereavement morbidity, we know that the quality of the dying and death experience itself impacts bereavement morbidity. And generally, the, the better the death by, and that's the subjective evaluation of that experience, but the better the death experience, uh, the less intense bereavement morbidity uh, we'll see in caregivers in 10 to 12 months after, after loss. Uh, and we're looking, we're learning more about other risk factors. We know certainly the nature of death, so an unexpected death or one that seems particularly violent or traumatic, that's associated with worse bereavement morbidity. We know that location of death, so ICU death um, particularly, can be very traumatic and upsetting for families and lead to more um, bereavement morbidity. And there's some demographic data, although I would say it's mixed, you know, there's some suggestion maybe uh, this is higher uh, among women, older adults, individuals of lower income, non-Caucasians. So I had been involved in this work around quality of death and, and, and Renat Nassim and I became very interested in caregivers. It was clear to me that there was this whole other uh, realm of need that I hadn't been as focused on, certainly in my clinical work, and we weren't as focused on in a hospital, in our hospital setting. We began to do uh, focus group research, really trying to get a sense of our, from our current brief family caregivers, uh, what they were wanting. And it was very interesting that they were really frank about seeking support. So these are caregivers of advanced cancer patients. They were very quite frank about their support needs. I mean, in addition to practical, you know, connection to resources and, and those sorts of things, they, they talked about needing help with decision making in the face of intense uncertainty. So, you know, they're living with a loved one who has a life-threatening illness and they don't really know what the future holds. So how do they make decisions about their own lives? both in terms of practical issues around work and, and roles within the family, but also existentially, what should they be focusing on? What should be of value in the face of, of advanced disease? Um, they wanted information about the dying and death process and talked a lot about the difficulty of accessing that often, the, the difficulty of, of talking about mortality with the patient and with healthcare teams and feeling that uh, very ginger about those conversations, but really wanting to know more about what, what to expect in terms of the dying process. And they also wanted a chance to talk about not only their current distress, but anticipatory grief. So they wanted a chance to be supported in that process of preparing uh, for loss, preparing to disconnect, preparing for a life after their loved one. 
And they talked about a lot of barriers to receiving those supports that they that they wanted. So some of that I've already mentioned, this idea around the care being organized around the patient, um, difficulty with the timing of information provision. So often feeling like it was not the right time to ask questions and then waiting until it was too late and there'd be an event that then suddenly they would need information that they didn't already had, have. Um, and then also, as I mentioned before, this stigma, this tendency to dismiss their own needs uh, and um, underplay them, not ask for supports and feel that they they were uh, overstepping if they were to ask for their own consult, for instance, with our psychosocial oncology service. So I've been a big advocate that we need to think about grief before loss and we need to have a clinical approaches uh, and we need to think about supporting caregivers around these issues. Um, I think very simply, we, we need a lot of psychoeducation. Uh, we need to legitimize that caregiver distress. Um, we need to talk to them about what, to ex what they will experience. Uh, we need to validate some of the burdens that they're experiencing. And we need to help support them with the acknowledgement and preparation for loss, but also at the same time, maintain engagement with the patient. Um, and that's when I see caregivers clinically, that's a lot of the work I'm doing is helping them maintain this balance um, and uh, giving them permission to explore and name uh, their emotions about the experience. So all of that is background to this project that, um, that we've been engaged in now for uh, about a year and a half, which has been looking at um, the impact of medical assistance in dying in Canada on family caregivers. And when we began to do this work, uh, we were initially interested in what was out there. So we, the MAID pro, I mean, as across Canada, right, we all began our MAID programs and without a lot of understanding about what it would entail, what it would mean, and with very little guidance. And certainly we had very little to inform us in terms of what families might, might need. And we had done a, my team had done a review early on, looking at the, the literature that was out there around the time our legislation came through, just to get a sense in other jurisdictions where MAID was legal, what was the experience of family caregivers? And, and I think firstly, not surprisingly, very few studies were published. Actually, most the, there were more studies that had been published on the, on the healthcare provider experience of, of assisted dying than on the family caregiver experience. Yet, uh, I mean, I think those of us who see families as the unit of care recognize that families are the ones that are going to live with the result of the, that, that death experience and the nature of it. So we, we weren't getting a sense um, uh, from them about really what their experience and needs were. When we looked in that review, there was some literature on the bereavement experience, uh, but few studies had been published. Um, generally, they tended to show that there was less bereavement morbidity in caregivers who lost a loved one via assisted death compared to death from natural causes. Uh, but I think there's some big caveats about those findings. First of all, um, I think there's likely a significant response bias, and I, and I think that's probably a challenge for a lot of us researching in this area, and I'll talk a bit about it in our research. I think it's much more likely we're getting uh, reports from families who are uh, not opposed to assisted dying and supportive of, of the patient's request. We're probably not uh, as easily accessing families where there's a lot of high conflict. Um, and, and so we're, we might be missing those that are having the most negative experience. The other caveat, and this is maybe for another conversation, but it's I've, it's been quite interesting to me to look at the literature and present on medical assistance in dying uh, clinically, because I think that despite the, the legislation, it continues to be the case that it is a polarizing area. And certainly then we see in the research, I think, um, we can see sometimes I think people's biases play out in terms of how, how the research is conducted and sometimes the analysis of findings. So uh, that's also something I'm often thinking when I'm, when I'm reading the literature and, and I'm quite interested in is that as a conflict of interest or at least something that can interfere uh, potentially with uh, the research process around assisted dying. So we began to this project. For those of you uh, who aren't, I just give you, for those of you who aren't as familiar with medical assistance in dying, I just want to explain the context um, for this and the legislation, because it does, 
uh, play out in terms of the, the caregiver experience and some of the things I'm going to talk to you about in, in our preliminary data. So as most of you um, probably know, in June 2016, Bill C-14 legalized assisted dying in Canada. But more recently, we have Bill C-7, which has uh, proposed amendments to the legislation. And so th the, the initial criteria for Bill C C-14 were that uh, to be eligible for MAID, people had to, uh, first of all, be eligible for, for uh, health services funded by the government in Canada. Um, they had to be adults, uh, have an, a grievous and irremediable uh, con medical condition that would lead to a reasonably foreseeable death. And so now with Bill C-7, that's one of the proposed amendments that to, to remove that reasonably foreseeable aspect uh, of the criteria. The request had to be voluntary, it's no, not as a result of external pressure. So again, as I was talking about before, they, the focus is really here on the individual's decision and autonomy, and often the family is not taken into account and even excluded from the assessment process in some cases. Uh, and the patient has to be able to provide informed consent uh, and, and therefore be capable, uh, not confused um, in, a, in a way that would in, impair their capability to um, consent to the treatment. There were safeguards in place. You had to have two independent witnesses to your request. You had to have two independent assessments, although again, that, that's a proposed legislation change uh, to only one independent assessment. Um, certainly patients have the right to withdraw the request at any time. Um, there was a 10-day reflection period um, that may be changed and, and uh, the, even the uh, requirement around capacity to consent at the time of the procedure may change. Um, for those, uh, as, of, as part of C7, some of the safeguards for those uh, whose death is not reasonably foreseeable, a 90-day assessment period, two clarifications of informed consent, and a second assessment by someone with some expertise in the, in the condition causing suffering will be required. So uh, this study began um, in, in the context of the pre um, uh, proposed amendment changes. And we were really interested in looking at uh, patients and care caregivers and their experience right from the time of made request. We got some funding from Canadian Cancer Society to, uh, to do this study because the majority of individuals still now who request assisted dying uh, tend to be cancer patients. It's on average around 70%, and that's in most jurisdictions when we look at who is requesting assisted dying. Although for our study, we're actually looking at not just cancer diagnoses, so any, any request uh, from any disease site. Uh, this is a quantitative and qualitative study. We're collecting information at the time of made request and then also six months following patient death from bereaved caregivers. To be eligible, patients have to be requesting a maid uh, and their loved ones have to be adults, 18 years of age or older. And we're doing this research at University Health Network and Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center, both of which run hospital-based assisted dying programs. Uh, and also we're uh, recruiting through GTA Maid, which is a community organization that uh, supports providing assisted uh, dying in the home. I'm not going to talk, I have some preliminary data, I'm not going to talk about too much about the quantitative because we're just in the midst of things, but to give you a sense of this research and what we're looking at, it's quite broad in scope. Uh, for patients at the time of request, we're collecting a lot of demographics and disease information. We're also, we're interested in some factors, including their attachment style. So there's some interesting research uh, suggesting uh, something that I think we see clinically, that those who are, tend to request assistance dying are individuals who are more what we would call avoidant in terms of their relational or attachment style. So, and by that we mean uh, more independent, less likely to rely on others for support. Uh, and that sort of fits, I think, with assisted dying. It's, it's often uh, distress around a future anticipated dependency that is fueling people's requests for assisted dying. So we were interested in that construct. We're interested in knowing the nature of their suffering at the time of, of request. So with this Edmonton as a symptom assessment scale, uh, how depressed they were. Um, we're looking at death-related distress with a measure that's developed at our site called the Death and Dying Distress Scale. We wanted to know more 
broadly in general how they would rate their quality of life. And uh, we wanted also to get a sense of their satisfaction with care that they were receiving using the FAM care, which is a, um, and the patient version of that measure. For caregivers, we're assessing them at uh, the time of request and, uh, and what is T2, so six month follow up after patients have died, whether they uh, pursued assisted dying in the end or not. And we have some parallel measures, uh, similarly looking at caregivers' attachment, um, their own depression and quality of life and satisfaction with care. And then in follow-up, we're interested in, in grief uh, and bereavement morbidity. So using collecting information about stress response symptoms, grief, uh, depressive symptoms, and we're using the quality of dying and death questionnaire, which is uh, uh, one of the most validated and, and commonly used broad assessments of the quality of, uh, of dying and death experience with a bereaved caregiver respondent. So we're looking at that as well. So we're also involved in doing uh, qualitative interviews, doing those at uh, time one, around the time of made request, and then and then also following up with uh, caregivers. And so we've had an opportunity to do some preliminary analysis for about 25 of our T1 uh, patients. And and I just I again, this is all very preliminary, and how this will all play out when we're finished the qualitative analysis um, remains to be seen, but. I think that um, one of the findings that is most interesting, and I think it plays in a lot to what we're gonna talk about with the caregiver experience, is again, this idea of the relational and how important that is um, for the decision-making. So the, this is the patient, this is some of the patient qualitative data. And our patients were really talking about these two simultaneous processes they were engaged in at the time of May request, one is this achievement of private certainty, we've called that. That's an internal process of choosing uh, to whether to request and go forward with assistant dying. And that inc would include all of the factors that many of us consider um, in terms of you know, distress, that suffering, that's one of the criteria, uh, how they would um, con construct their future at the time of request, et cetera. But they also talked at length about what we've called seeking public certainly certainty. And this is the relational and interpersonal process of requesting and accessing MAID. And, and, it, and it, it, it takes up a lot of time, a lot of energy. There's a lot of conflict and difficulty that comes from this more public and relational aspect to the MAID request. Um, it involves both the personal relationships in someone's life. So communicating that, that thought about assisted dying to family and sometimes helping to negotiate that decision with family. And then also the navigating the healthcare system around the decision, including one's healthcare team, a made assessment team, uh, and the relational piece of, of that. And, and patients talked a lot about the, the concerns they had about how their loved ones and their healthcare providers would see this decision and having to navigate then the, um, the emotional and relational fallout of some of those decisions. So again, what's fascinating to me as a, as a psychiatrist working in this area is how something that seems like a, a fairly, uh, you know, clearly circumscribed medical decision, of course, is embedded within these complex relationships that are hugely important into how, the, how this is navigated um, by patients. So this brings us to the, the caregiver qualitative results. And again, this is all very preliminary. We have about 20 um, caregiver interviews analyzed at this time. And um, these are, this particular uh, subgrouping have a wide age range. So 36 to 83, uh, again, predominantly female, as we talked about the majority of caregivers remain female and most caregiver research is predominantly female respondents. 85% Caucasian, I think this is really important to note. Uh, I would, we can talk about this if you like. In our research, this is a, a, a big, I would say, issue uh, and limitation at the, re with the research that gets conducted at my facility where the majority of our respondents in research, regardless of the nature of the research, tend to be Canadian born or identify as Caucasian. So it really limits our generalizability. But uh, nonetheless, um, going, you know, we can talk more about that, but, you know, that tends, those tend to be the, the group that are coming to, seeking mate at our, our facility as well, predominantly Caucasian. 
uh, in terms of their relationship with the patient, there was a real variety uh, in this study. Uh, actually, not it was not a um, predominantly spouses; it was predominantly children. But there were a variety of other relationships. Uh, where there was some variability in the timing of the interviews. So some some of these occurred during the reflection period. There is this mandatory ten day reflection period after a request. But there were a few cases where the interviews had to take place shortly after patient death because the intervention was scheduled um, uh, more urgently and we were not able to interview the, the caregiver before. Um, and there was one case where the patient unfortunately died before uh, assisted dying was able to be provided. So in terms of the, the results, and this is just the preliminary analysis at this point, but uh, we've the metaphor that we've been using to understand this is one of a race, uh, what, uh, what we're calling a race to the end. Um, you know, it's not an unusual metaphor in advanced disease. We, there are some other qualitative research that talks about the marathon of caregiving for patients with advanced cancer. Uh, these caregivers were really talking about a race, a sort of sprint that began around the time that MAID was discussed and requested. And uh, within that metaphor, caregivers were placing themselves uh, and in different positions. Um, sometimes a caregiver had a particular position that was maintained through the whole process and sometimes they moved positions. Um, and those were this idea of position of co-runner, an onlooker, uh, or someone who was uh, focused on prepar preparing for the finish line. Uh, and I'm going to go into a little more depth talking about those, but the factors that were, we found influencing these positions had to do with not just the practical demands of the process of assisted dying, but, but relational factors. So again, the, our caregivers talked at length about their relationship with the patient, how they understood the patient, uh, what they could feel comfortable talking about or not, what the patient wanted them involved in or did not. And that, but another factor as well was their own orientation uh, towards assisted dying uh, philosophically. So their own ethical uh, orientation to, to that intervention. And all of those factors then influenced how they, uh, how they played, um, positioned themselves uh, in, that, in this race. So I'll just give you a few, some quote examples that, uh, to illustrate. Um, so our co-runners, sometimes some of them talked about feeling that they were running this race with the patient very much at the same pace. They were involved, they were advocating. Um, they were often worried about the patient's ability to access MAID and wanting to facilitate that. And they really felt that they were running this race with, with their loved one. But there were also co-runners who were right there and involved, but were a bit off pace. And, uh, and this could have been perhaps because they weren't completely um, sure they wanted to support the, the pursuing of assisted dying, uh, excuse me, or um, uh, because they didn't, they didn't themselves feel ready uh, for that. Uh, but generally, these co-runners uh, had good relationships with their patient loved ones, felt generally these gen were generally secure attachment relationships, uh, very mutually supportive. There were also caregivers who talked about being much more in an onlooker position. Uh, they talked about watching and waiting, uh, often wanting to let the patient lead the way in that process uh, or feeling some resignation that their opinion did not matter that ultimately they they had they had no part to play uh, and sort of watching that process uh, unfold and there were also caregivers who talked about this responsibility for for the end for the finish line uh, there for anyone who's been involved in the assisted dying process once once that request is made and if someone's approved and they there there can be a 10 day wait although it sometimes can be waived if patient capacity is in question uh, there is a a lot to do to prepare and and caregivers were often very focused on all of that practical work um, and sometimes had this talked about uh, needing to focus on their own needs later uh, and, and feeling an in intense responsibility for making sure that that end was as good as possible for their loved ones. 
We also wanted to collect information about their support needs um, because ultimately we would really like to be able to design our clinical made programs with their needs in mind. And so uh, again, I think that a lot of families were, we talked about this in the past, the sense that it's hard to uh, ask for support, ask questions when the patient is, is the designated unit of care. And many families were really struggling about navigation of MADE and organizing it um, and how to access coordination. Um, how to communicate and really feeling a lot of responsibility for that uh, and feeling that pressure. So families requiring information and resources was a, a huge theme. But another huge theme, again, not surprisingly, given all that I've said, uh, but really came out in, in these interviews was the their wish to be recognized as a receiver of care that MAID was something that the family was being affected by. And when MAID providers uh, or assessors asked how they felt, asked how they were coping, asked if they were ready, got in, them involved in that process, it was uh, very meaningful and often led to generally feeling calmer and more positive about the entire process. So, so I think that here in these interviews, family were really saying, saying they wanted to be seen as, as part of the process and, and not sidelined. So I think, again, this is preliminary research and, and I will have to come back and talk to you again about the when this study is finished in another year and a half, uh, what all of the findings are. But I think that one of the things that's really come through to me, uh, as I've mentioned, is firstly, this the relational nature of assisted dying requests. And also um, the, I think the, the shared problem of end of life distress, this really highlights for me. Um, you know, I, I think we're talking more and more in the literature about this problem as a shared problem that patients and family members and healthcare providers all struggle with mortality related distress when a patient has advanced disease that uh, as certainly as healthcare providers, we struggle to talk with patients about death and dying and help them prepare. These are very fraught and difficult conversations, not just because we, we, we don't have the, the communication tools, but because we're coping with our own death-related anxieties when we have those conversations. And that because of that distress, that shared distress, there can be a preference to not speak of it and, and sometimes to uh, focus on active approaches to treatment uh, as a way to avoid having those conversations. And again, for anyone who works in cancer care, I, or I think it's, it's often clear that treatment and procedures are sometimes offered in place of conversations about supportive or palliative care uh, as a way to avoid that confrontation. And that's sometimes the reason I think patients in my hospital are on clinical trials, chemotherapy, uh, even when they, when they die, because those conversations are being avoided. And, and I think we've seen that assisted dying is something this was really driven by the public. Um, the, the legislation was pushed by, by public demand because of our communal death-related distress, that it's because often of well people's concern about their end-of-life experience and wanting to maintain autonomy and control uh, that that has been, that the legislation has come through. And made can be seen as a way to deal with that death-related distress. Um, and of course, I think what we're finding, and I think a lot of our my research is really bearing this out, is that for patients, this may be a solution to that distress. But of course, it's not the made process is not necessarily a solution for the death related distress that their family members feel. That families are left um, with their own grief uh, and experience, and uh, and that that isn't the problem for them is not solved uh, by assisted dying. And in fact, in some cases, it's complicated by a patient's um, uh, focus on their own needs and autonomy. Uh, and in cases where our caregivers are sidelined in that onlooker role or so focused on their burdens and responsibilities around tending to the finish line, um, that that may uh, leave them with a lot more distress um, in terms of their own grief and bereavement. 
I just want to say then a little bit about interventions. You know, I can't, I am thinking about this all the time as we're doing this research, what are we going to be putting in place for caregivers? And um, I'm involved, the other real focus of my, of my, my research uh, and my clinical work is around uh, psychotherapeutic support for patients. And I've been involved with Gary Roden in developing Managing Cancer and Living Meaningfully, which is a brief psychotherapy for patients with advanced disease and thinking about adapting this for caregivers uh, and including some discussion around assisted dying and preparation around anticipatory grief. Uh, that is really sort of the next chapter and focus for us. So when we when we write about calm and talk about calm, um, we talk about these four domains that are the content uh, for the intervention. And, and we can apply these very beautifully, I think, as well to caregivers. And we're beginning to develop some material um, uh, around focus, a calm focus for caregivers specifically. When these are the four calm domains, and I think we can, for caregivers, when we're talking about symptom management and communication, information resource needs, helping them advocate and support patients while at the same time respecting patient autonomy and independence. That's certainly a major theme uh, we could be focusing on with caregivers in this intervention around the relational domain. Uh, caregivers need a lot of support in terms of changing roles within the family, uh, acknowledging their own support needs uh, and how to access support and also how to communicate and, and support children in the family. That's a role that often fall, uh, falls to family caregivers. I think family similarly struggle with meaning and purpose in the face of loss and trying to understand and come to terms with the suffering of a loved one. Uh, and then the fourth domain in calm is one around the future and mortality. And certainly, again, as I've said, I think we can do a lot to support caregivers in terms of acknowledging and normalizing their distress, their anticipatory grief, and helping them to prepare and plan for the future. Um, so uh, I think in summary, I would really emphasize that in addition to the usual challenges associated with caring for patients with advanced disease, which I talked about uh, to begin with, for, for family of those requesting MAID, there are additional practical, relational, and philosophical challenges. And we see those play out in terms of how family position themselves throughout that experience. I think families are requesting and can probably benefit from some very simple interventions by actual MAID teams. Firstly, considering that MAID occurs within the context of a family. So thinking about that, that unit uh, uh, of care, inquiring about and responding to family needs and distress, I think is very important and very appreciated. Validating, educating uh, around normal grief, uh, where the goal is not to eliminate that grief, but to provide support. Uh, I think that's what families need and encouraging them to seek additional supports and resources beyond that main team as needed. And I would also really emphasize that I, I believe that all of this research needs to really in, inform our clinical care, training of clinicians and evidence-based interventions that are gonna help us address the death-related distress that occurs not just in patients, but in their families as well. And we need to have uh, more, better frameworks that we can easily rely on um, in order to, to provide that kind of support. So I think um, I'm gonna open it up for questions and comments. Um, I just wanted to leave you with this thought. This was Cicely Saunders quote, how people die remains in the memory of those who live on. And I think this is so important for us to remember when we're caring for patients, they're part of something larger and, and that, that death experience, that end of life, the quality of that death is gonna be very important to that family unit. And, uh, and so to think about them, support them in that process. So thank you. I am thank going you to very much, uh, Dr. Dale. That was um, that was great. It was really great to hear um, this research, and even though it's preliminary findings, I think very informative. And we already have uh, a question. I would encourage people to type in their questions into the chat box. But we have a question from uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Barb Pessett, and she asks. Um, Thank you for this excellent presentation. How do you think these experiences might change under the, the changes proposed in Bill C-7? 
I know it's speculation, but you might have thought about this. No, of course. And that's why that's why those are going to be two chapters of qual the qualitative analysis. There'll be this pre C7 and the post C7. I, you know, actually, I'm not, I don't think it is going to change significantly. You know, I think one, certainly one of the drivers of that urgency, that race has been around patient capacity and, and family caregivers very worried about patients losing capacity. And I think as those of us involved with made assessment as well, we worry about that. But I think even without that, uh, even without, um, even if patients are able to, you know, provide their their uh, their consent before the intervention and lose capacity, and we don't have those weights, I think there will still be that some urgency. I think it's the very, it's knowing that there is a date that mm -hmm. gets that race going. I think for family caregivers. Um, it's so different from the process where there's just uncertainty. We don't know when somebody's going to die. And those of us, again, work in, in hospices or in palliative care units, we know that we're, we sometimes have an idea when patients are, and are dying, but we often are very poor at guessing uh, right up until the day or, or the day before. And so, but once you have that date set, um, so much gets started in motion for caregivers. And uh, I think some of it is that is the fear and anticipation of that of the grief experience. Um, it's also the activation and emotional distress of everyone around them. But there's so much practically that needs to be done. Um, mm -hmm. And there's something you know interesting, also in some of our our interviews. You know, the there's more pressure in a way I think than around the actual day of made being particularly special and family caregivers take a lot of that responsibility on themselves wanting to make it as perfect as possible mm -hmm. uh, for their loved ones i think caregivers experience that anyway often wanting to facilitate the best death but there's this added level of pressure when we're setting a date uh, and time so we'll see i mean i'm going to come back and i'll talk to you about that research great. i think that I, I actually don't think it's going to change enormously i think the race is partly Having, having that date set and knowing when it's coming. Great. Barb has a, one additional question. Uh, do you have any evidence about how nurses can better support family caregivers at the moment of MAID? Um, I don't know if your interviews explored that or not in terms of at that moment yeah. uh, of MAID. You know, that's, um, I work with an incredible team. I wish that they, she was here. I, I work with one ing incredible advanced practice nurse who is really, is often in the, in our, in our facilities, often in the room with families. And she's got a lot of great expertise um, uh, around that. So I wish she was here to, to mention it. I mean, I think what, what the research, these interviews are really, and, and, and to be clear, in a lot of cases, I'm interview these interviews are, are caregivers before, the actual made intervention. So when I, again, when I come back and talk to you about six months after patient death, we'll have their retrospective re review and report about what the actual made day was like for them. But these family caregivers, I think in general are just wanting to be considered. I mean, I think that when somebody turns to them and asks them how they are, inquires, uh, is supportive, listens uh, to that response, um, seems caring and considerate, um, I think that that goes a long way. Uh, a lot of our family caregivers are really feeling either by the patient or the made process and the legislation shut out from the experience. So I think just that, just that mindset of including uh, family in that process, asking about them, um, I think is very, very important. And then every family is different in terms of what they, their exact support needs. But having that mindset, I think is one of the most important things. I, I imagine I'm talking to a I'm preaching to the choir, right? Because I think probably all of you know that. Um, uh, I work in a facility where families are not are often unseen, and I'm and um, but I think that that's that's really one of the most important things, and that's why you know even the way the lot of the way made um, sit, um, programs have been set up, even I think have been exclusionary of the family um, and the family experience, and so. Uh, that's really the at the very basic level what I'm trying to advocate for is to think for us to think broadly. It's it's so interesting that sense of urgency that you capture with the race to the end, and I think that's really what our experience at our hospice has been. There's a sense of urgency. There's that day and time, and that's felt by staff and our volunteers and the family. Um, 
And what I'm hearing you say is we really need to dig deep into that hospice palliative care philosophy about pulling the family into the unit of care. Mm -hmm. um, can you comment on, um, well, Daryl um, had a comment. Are there any other books or resources you'd recommend to folks when supporting people within the context of MAID? Well, I think that there, this is a, there's a big void. Um, I mean, uh, there aren't that many jurisdictions. I mean, it's growing, but where MAID is legal. So, you know, this is, I mean, it's one of the fascinating things about this area. It's sort of wide open. We don't have a lot of evidence to guide us and we're making it up as we go along. So again, this legislation came through and in most cases, hospitals and you know, the programs were scrambling to set up yeah. there. and we're work, we're learning as we go. Um, yeah. Certainly, um, Dying with Dignity and CAMAP, which is the Canadian Association of Made Assessors and Providers, is a great resource. They do a lot of education, support a lot of research uh, in this area. So that's an organization that I think is worth connecting to if, if people want more information. But I think those books have to be written. Um, I think we still yeah. have, to, have to do that. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned those, um, those two organizations. When I was looking um, to develop a resource for our staff here and our um, patients and families that we support, I looked through all like the big national organizations support for caregivers within the context of MAID. I couldn't find anything, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't find a single thing about how to support family, a family caregiver when they agree with MAID or disagree, those philosophical differences. And it's really tricky for our staff. Yeah, well, and it's, it's you know, I, so I actually just, um, I just gave a talk, so to CAMAP about this topic. And what was really fascinating to me is that, um, and I think we're seeing this across the country, that a lot of people involved with made assessment and provision don't necessarily have expertise in end of life care. Um, they don't necessarily have, aren't necessarily from hospice or the world of, of palliative care where we have that family perspective. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily psychiatrists uh, or people have, or psychologists, people have psychosocial, um, you know, uh, training. And yeah. they really are, um, they, they, are, they are those individuals who didn't see it as a family issue, right? Their job was to come in and, and in some ways, and in some ways made is designed that way. I mean, it really is, it's, it's very simple, the assessment procedure. It's just figuring out if you meet the criteria or not. Uh, um, but, and so they weren't thinking about it in that sense, you know, and, and I think that we need to embed it back into the world of, of end of life care. And it's one, it's one potential end uh, for people's lives. And we need to think about it within that end of life care context, as opposed to take it out of there. I'm trying to put it back in, you know, conceptually, because I think you're right. Um, it hasn't been on people's radar that this is a family issue or that it made us made, made interventionists should have some, expertise in supporting people around grief or know what to do when people are very tearful or upset or angry. Uh, and I think we, I think there's a lot we need to do to, to better train individuals. So. So that Sarah, that touches on one question that's come up, um, building on this role and training of volunteers, which is also a question about how we can better train volunteers, but also whether there's been any mention or any experiences of family caregivers in your data around end of life doulas, or if you have any observations about their role in, in bridging any gaps and supporting families. Yeah, I, so in, in our, we, we never had uh, in, our, in our studies so far, we haven't had anybody who's had an end of life doula involved in their, in their, uh, actual May Day. So it'll be interesting again when I come back, I'll tell you the rest of the story yeah. and maybe we, we are going to find that. I think probably we'll see less of that in my samples given the fact that these are predominantly two hospital-based um, MAID programs where MAID is provided in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Not that death doulas would not be welcome, but it, I think it's very, it's, it's like birth at at home versus birth in the hospital. I think yeah. we often see doula, birth doulas more often at home than in the hospital. But I think this idea of people who have expertise in, in supporting people through this process in terms of both the practical and the emotional and the spiritual. I mean, I, I'm, 
I absolutely believe that's what we need. We need, and if and if doulas uh, are end of life doulas are the people who have some of those that expertise, then I, I really want them involved, um, and I want them to be part of this process again that we see made as another kind of death, but part of that a greater end of life experience um, that we're we're helping patients and families plan for. Uh, so I think it, I think it'll be really interesting what, and, and maybe we're going to have to have a separate study that's more community based where we get the doula, um, mm -hmm. the doula perspective. Do you think it's possible to train uh, volunteers in part of the, or some of the calm therapy to support that work? Because I realize not everybody across Canada is going to have calm therapists available to them. And so well, uh, that Joan. Okay. <laughs> Um, first of all, I have to say, as a plug for Calm, if anyone's ever interested in learning more about that, because Calm, I would say, um, Calm isn't the same as, as what the role of a death doula is, but the philosophy is the same. It's helping people, uh, this is earlier on, not often near the very end of life, but helping people prepare for uh, end of life. So thinking about mortality and preparing and coping with mortality related distress. So it's, it's on the con that continuum. And, and we do a lot of training uh, of all different kinds of disciplines. Um, it's a very ultra brief intervention. It really is early palliative, psychological palliative care. That's really what calm is. And uh, can we teach volunteers? Absolutely. Will it be different than what we see uh, from an actual therapist? Yes. I mean, it would be, it would be a different, it would look different. Um, uh, calm as we've traditionally trained people is an actual psychotherapy. So it's, it's, tr we're training people who have psychotherapy within their scope of practice, whether they are nurses or social workers or psychiatrists. But I think there is something we can do that's calm like with volunteers. And in fact, I mean, what calm basically is, it's a framework any of us who work in hospice or palliative care, supporting individuals psychologically, who have some understanding of existential theory and, and, and psychodynamic theory are probably doing something calm like that's, but calm is a framework to teach people really and to study it uh, and show benefits. So, so absolutely. That was fabulous. I see our time is up, unfortunately, but we'll have to have you back again when, uh, when you have this study completed for sure. It's been very, it's fascinating, it's timely, and, um, and clearly um, further developments in MAID uh, we can expect in the future. And so um, it's a topic that we need to stay on top of and, and provide training. So thank you very much for sharing your research with us today. And so on behalf of the North Okan Okanagan Hospice Society and uh, the Institute, um, our warmest, warmest thanks. And I also want to thank all the participants from across the country that joined us. We had over 80 participants, which is nice to see. And so uh, we hope you'll come back and join us again. So thank you, everyone, and uh, have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Yeah.